All right. Hi, everyone. Um, and welcome to Centering Disability in Design, a panel conversation. My name is Kirsten Sweeney, and uh, I use they or she pronouns, and I am the Accessibility and Inclusion Manager at Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum, which means that my job is to prioritize disabled experiences in all areas of the museum through programs, including through programs like this one. Um, I am a non-binary autistic person with uh, short, shaggy, dark brown hair. Um, I'm wearing glasses with red frames, and I have on a white collared shirt today. Um, you might see me glancing down in front of me. That's because I am reading off of a script. <laughs> um, we have live cart captioning and ASL interpretation available for this program. Um, you can access the captions from your Zoom menu um, by clicking the, the captions button. Um, and our interpreters will be spotlighted along with the speakers throughout the program. Um, there will be a few slides later on at the towards the beginning of the presentation, um, and all and all visuals will be described. You can use the Zoom Q and A feature to ask the panelists questions throughout today's program. You can also use the Zoom reaction feature, as I already see some people doing, to express your, your nonverbal <laughs> excitement or agreement or anything like that with what's going on. Um, but if you submit something in the Q&A, we will answer as many questions as we can during the Q&A section at the end of today's program. You can also use the Q&A to let us know if you have any unmet access needs today. This program is all about centering disability, and that includes making this space as disability-centered as possible. Um, we're going to move slowly today, honoring our needs and savoring our time in disability community together. Please don't hesitate to share what you need in order to participate today, including asking our panelists to slow down or repeat things if needed. Today's program will be 90 minutes long. The panel conversation will last until about 4 p.m. Eastern. It's 3.05 Eastern right now. So in about an hour, we'll wrap up the panel, um, after which we'll take a five minute break and then return for our Q&A until 4.30. Um, so with that, we'll dive into today's conversation. Um, I wanna start by saying that this Centering Disability in Design program is one of many free programs that Cooper Hewitt is offering as part of our 2023 National Design Week celebrations. Um, and launched in 2006, National Design Week celebrates the important role design plays in all aspects of daily life. Um, and it's held in conjunction with our annual National Design Awards. Um, National Design Week is going through this Sunday. Uh, so you can head to our website, cooperhewitt.org, to learn more about some of the other exciting programs that we have going on this week, and also learn about this year's award winners. So now I will pass things off to our moderator for today's conversation, Dr. Bess Williamson. Uh, Dr. Williamson is a historian of design and material culture and Professor of Art History, Theory, and Criticism at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. She is the author of Accessible America, A History of Disability and Design, and co-editor of Making Disability Modern, Design Histories. Her work explores diverse histories and practices of design that extend expertise to users and communities and challenge designers to address access and power in their work. Um, Bess, I'm going to spotlight you, and over to you. Hi, um, thank you so much, Kirsten, um, and thank you to our interpreters and captioners. Uh, there's a lot of people working on this um, broadcast, both visible and invisible, um, and I just really, I guess, especially want to appreciate Kirsten's attention to access and can we all take this invitation to slow down in our Zoom Zoom calls? Um, so I'm working on that, thinking about that as we enter in here. Um, I am 
Bess, I'm a white middle-aged woman with brown hair and metal glasses. I'm wearing a black collared shirt and a rebirth garments neck kerchief with purple and black patterning. Um, and I'm joining you from a slightly cluttered bedroom office in Chicago. Um, and I'm gonna introduce each of the three panelists as they show some of their work. So we asked them to um, make a couple of slides to introduce their work. So I'm gonna introduce each panelist um, with their slides so that we can kind of keep all of their amazing histories and accolades in mind as we hear them speak. Um, so our first panelist will be Olivia May M. Ascension, um, who uses she, her pronouns. Olivia has oriented her career path toward building inclusive communities as an architect and design researcher from Oakland, California. She started off with helping Bay Area nonprofit organizations through construction, project, and property management, including the Ed Roberts Campus, a universally designed building in Berkeley that houses several disability-centered organizations. She then transitioned into the design and construction of public safety buildings, public sector offices and community spaces, and K through 12 educational facilities with a focus on going beyond the building code minimums and finding creative solutions to enhancing accessibility in the built environment. Ascension's notable research projects include a study assessing the efficiency, the um, sorry, the efficacy and accessibility of existing evacuation protocols and building safety codes, collaboration with university faculty on the post-occupancy evaluation of the Ed Roberts campus, and a Fulbright program pro uh, project studying the accessibility of elementary schools in the Philippines. She's currently serving as a public member of the U.S. Access Board. Um, so Olivia, we're looking forward to hearing about your work. Thank you so much, Bess. And um, uh, I wanted to start off uh, by saying thank you to Cooper Hewitt for inviting us all here today uh, to talk to you about something that all of us here on this panel are so passionate about. Um, I myself am really excited to be here. Um, as Bess mentioned, my name is Olivia Asunshan. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Uh, I am a Filipina woman with uh, medium length dark hair, uh, tan skin and dark glasses. I'm currently wearing a top that is my favorite color, yellow. Um, I hail to you all from my bedroom in Oakland, California. Um, and I use a wheelchair, which is an important part of how I became the architect that I am today. Um, so growing up in the Philippines during a time when accessibility and architecture was not quite a priority, and then at the age of 11, moving to the United States uh, just a few years after the ADA was passed, um, there was this pretty jarring transition in experience um, that led me to this sudden um, freedom of movement. Uh, and that was so mind blowing for uh, young Olivia. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, it was at that point um, at a pretty young age that I quickly and very clearly realized that the design of the built environment has the power to foster independence, uh, promote inclusivity, and create community. Next slide. Further on into my career, I've also learned that one of the keys to ensuring justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, which you know are concepts that we are that we are putting great value um, in these last few years, is really providing accessibility for everybody and. What I strive to be, my role in the building industry, is to advocate for that principle uh, in what I will show you to be the following interconnected sectors. Next slide. And Bess started um, describing uh, the projects that I've been working on already, but uh, I wanted to share them with you myself. And the first, of course, is architectural design. Uh, I've been very fortunate to um, have worked with firms who value serving people and who I can easily have open dialogues with when it comes to the importance of accessibility. Uh, on the screen are some 
uh, are images of some of the projects that I have worked on uh, in the last few years. Um, and one commonality that they all have is whether we're designing um, fire stations or laboratories, uh, high school gyms or classroom buildings, uh, what we want is to represent the invisible um, and to advocate for the people who might have historically felt left out in these spaces uh, and shifting design perspectives to make sure that the marginalized have the opportunities to participate and experience um, the built surroundings. Next, next slide. The second sector is design research, uh, learning more about how architecture affects human behavior and movement. Um, some of the work that I've done, uh, again, which Beth has, has mentioned, um, includes assessing the accessibility of fire and life safety code requirements and theorizing potential solutions on how to make fire safety design and emergency protocols better for those who cannot evacuate easily and independently. Uh, on the left of the screen is uh, a copy of my research poster. Um, and then on the right, yeah, I was also incredibly fortunate to be involved in the post-construction management. And then five years later, the post-occupancy evaluation of the Ed Roberts campus. Um, so the photo on the right shows uh, kind of its crown jewel of um, an image of a, a bright red helical ramp that goes from the first floor to the second floor. And next slide. And the latest research project that I started last year as part of the Fulbright program and is still ongoing um, is a study on the accessibility of elementary schools in the Philippines. Um, tying that back to my roots, I wanted to see for myself how access to education for disabled children has changed since I last lived there. Um, I spent nine months over there, learned about all the things that have improved uh, and unfortunately not improved. Um, so on the screen are some photos. Uh, the top row show uh, the environment, the learning environments that exist in the Philippines. Um, and one of the things that I also value is um, how much I connected with a lot of wonderful people uh, as shown on the bottom row of photos where I met a lot of um, learners with disabilities. Uh, I tell people that it's the hardest thing I've ever done, uh, but it's also undoubtedly the greatest motivation for me to keep this conversation going. Uh, next slide. Which is why I'm also really active in public advocacy. Um, being active in architectural organizations like the American Institute of Architects, um, speaking at events like this, uh, I am given the greatest opportunities to meet like-minded people, much like you all in this discussion, um, and provided with an incredible platform to share what I'm most passionate about. Um, and as for the latest thing that's happening, I'm really excited and honored for my latest venture of being appointed um, this past July to be part of the U.S. Access Board. And that's me in a nutshell. Thank you so much, Olivia. Um, and I think we can go to the next slide and I'll just speak over the slide um, before Sky talks about it themselves. Um, so Sky Kubakob, uh, who uses pronouns they, them, say, them, zir, is a non-binary, xenogender, disabled, Filipinx, neuroqueer from Chicago, Illinois. We, uh, they are the creator of Rebirth Garments, a line of wearables for trans, queer, and disabled people of all sizes and ages, which started in summer 2014. Sky is the editor of the Radical Visibility Zine, a full color cut and paste style zine that celebrates disabled queer life with an emphasis on joy. Additionally, they are the Access Brat and the editor of a section on ethics and inclusion called Cancel and Gretel at the literary fashion magazine, Just Them and Dandy. Sky has most recently been working on a free online queer crip 
DIY fashion program with the Chicago Public Library called Radical Fit. Sky was named 2018 Chicagoan of the Year by the Chicago Tribune and is a 2019-2020 Kennedy Center citizen artist and a Disability Futures Fellow. All right, Sky, we're ready for you. Thank you so much, Bess. This is Sky speaking. Uh, I'm Sky Kubakub, they, them, they, them pronouns. I'll do a little audio description of myself. I'm small, Filipinx. I have a scale male headpiece in pink and a bunch of other colors, but mostly pink. Spiky triangle eyeliner under one eye that's asymmetrical. Turquoise lips. Queer crip symbol laser cut plexiglass uh, pink earrings, which are uh, a design of mine that includes the newer accessibility icon from the Accessibility Icon Project, mishmashed with the trans symbol. And then I'm wearing a disco muscle poof uh, jumpsuit. Uh, that makes me feel really strong because it has these like added little uh, muscles on my shoulders. So it just like <laughs> gives me some strength uh, visually. It's in a rainbow of colors and features some prints that are my late father's paintings that are very geometric, have a lot of golden ratio spirals and uh, jewel tones. I'm sitting in front of a background by Sparklezilla. Uh, that's mylar and a bunch of bright pink and uh, turquoise vinyls. And then I have two signs that I've created, one that says nothing without us and one that says radical visibility. So on the screen, uh, there is a photo of me uh, same description pretty much, but with a, um, a unitard in colorful neons and jewel tones and black and white patterns, along with a crop top in uh, scale mail and chain mail. And I'm standing next to Alice Wong of the Disability Visibility Project, uh, who's wearing dazzle camo, uh, black and white pattern uh, clashing leggings with the seams on the outside and a cape and some chainmail accessories along with a beanie that says Crip on it. And then right next to her squatting on the ground is Nina Litoff, uh, who is was just my employee at the time wearing a darker all black sheer chevron dress with a big chainmail piece uh, on her chest and we all have like geometric colorful makeup so i run rebirth garments which is a clothing line for queer and trans disabled folks of all sizes and ages and i started it after i both had the experience as a young teen not having the access to gender affirming undergarments that were both celebratory of my identities, uh, but also aesthetically pleasing and matched my style. Uh, most of them were very medicalizing and kind of just ugly band-aid looking gender affirming garments, but uh, they wouldn't feel fun to have people really look at them. So I wanted to make garments that, that showed off all of my identities. I then gained a, a physical, a more physical disability when I was 21. I had always been neurodivergent and like radically visibly mad my whole life. Uh, but uh, my stomach stopped working when I was 21. Now I'm pretty sure it had to do with my polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, but I stopped being able to wear a lot of the 
clothing that I uh, had previously worn because I like to wear a lot of like really tight skinny jeans. So I had to make really comfy things with very soft waistbands or like no waistband at all, like the unitards um, or like this muscle poof jumpsuit. Um, and yeah, I had wanted to make clothing for disabled folks previous to that and had made a little bit for a cousin of mine. But I, as I gained this more physical disability, I, or like, yeah, um, I wanted to be able to make clothing that would be good for that and my neurodivergencies with um, sensory sensitivities and showing off my non-binary identity. And I figured if that was something that I needed, that then there would be lots of folks who would want it. And so I interviewed lots of folks to find out the types of things that they would want to wear. And now I make dance wear, active wear, swim wear, and then uh, lingerie or undergarments. Can I have the next slide? So I gained a, another new disability in the end of 2019. I had mononucleosis uh, from Epstein-Barr virus, which then turned into the post-viral illness, chronic fatigue syndrome. And I no longer was able to do as much work as I, as I did previously, because I was sleeping 15 to 20 hours a day. So I just really can't physically do a lot of the things that I did before. And it also impacted a lot of my like strength and balance and things like that. So I got really, I've gotten really into teaching youth and teens how to create their own intersectional clothing lines. So this is a photo from my Radical Fit Incubator and my Rebirth Warriors Incubator. Radical Fit is my program with the Chicago Public Library. Uh, there are currently 90 free DIY videos on the U Media Chicago YouTube, where you can go see lots of tutorials on all sorts of DIY fashion, from makeup to hair, to nails, um, to sewing your own chest binder, um, and all sorts of things like that. But we started it, or I started an incubator project two years ago, uh, where I had students who were queer and disabled uh, apply to Chicago Public Library um, to be a part of it, as well as private students who I just knew who were uh, queer or non-binary or disabled. And we started making lots of clothes together. So this is a photo from our most recent show, uh, Queer Radical Fair. This is the fourth Queer Radical Fair we've done. And a lot of these, uh, there's 22 models um, wearing 10 different uh, designers works. From, and the designers are from eight years old to uh, not like 18, 19 years old. And we have models ranging from eight years old to 67 years old in this photo. So there's a lot of brightly colored spandex. There's disabled folks, there's a wheelchair user um, and everybody's wearing uh, KN95 masks in this photo. Um, yeah, so this is my current project that I've been focusing on because I just don't, since I don't have the capacity to run rebirth garments the way that I used to, I just wanted to be able to then pass my knowledge on to the next generation so they can fill in the gaps that I'm leaving by becoming more disabled. Um, and yeah, so I'm just excited for all of their work. Uh, thank you, Bess.
Great. Uh, thank you, Sky. Um, all right. Our third panelist is Christine Hempel. Um, Christina is a disability and age inclusive researcher, designer, and innovator. In 2015, she founded and continues to lead Open Inclusion, a London-based global insight, design, and innovation agency. Hempel is a certified member of the Market Research Society, a certified professional in accessibility with the IAAP, and currently chairs MRS Unlimited, the Disability Inclusive Research Sector Group in the UK. She's an ambassador for Co-Innovate at Brunel University and a past leader and ongoing active member of the Inclusive Design for XR Group at XR Access. She was originally an economist and Asian studies scholar, got an MBA while having kids, and has a weird and wonderful background that includes marketing, strategy, design, and innovation in mining, steel, rail, and shipping, defense, aviation, retail, banking, wealth management, and even having a short period as a professional athlete before finding her real home in inclusive insight, design, and innovation. She's never felt more at home. As a neurodivergent individual and parent, wife, aunt, and daughter of family members who have different access needs and disabilities, understanding and designing for human differences is a personal and professional joy. So Christine, let's hear from you. Thank you, Bess, and what a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much to the Keeper Hewitt for making this space and for making a space that is inclusive uh, in its uh, design, but also in the content and you know, we're all on this journey of inclusion and the thing I love most about um, this is it's constant uncovery, uh, uncovering and discovery. So let's discover together. Um, I'm a white, younger feeling, older looking woman in uh, with short, uh, darker hair, curly, um, in a wood panelled environment, it looks like it might be a shed down the back of the garden. Um, it's actually just the house we live in France um, with open on in wood on the uh, wall behind me um, and I'm wearing a dark blue top. Um, I uh, founded Open Inclusion in 2015 with a really singular perspective or reason for it being there that still drives everything we do today. And that is to bring the perspectives of disabled and older individuals into design and innovation so that we can do better. Um, there's a slide that we've got up, which says great design requires great insight and that the best insights come from those with significantly differentiated perspectives. Through experience and, you know, I, you heard I had a background in all sorts of weird and wonderful places but I had some, we had personal experience of disability. I'd always been neurodivergent and known that difference. Had some experiences that went kind of across the different perspectives of how we move, sense, think and feel differently as humans and realized that these two toolkits that I was holding, design and innovation, were the fault and the cause of a lot of the failure I was seeing in the world around us. So your know, opens really set up to help listen more broadly to those that today tend to be underheard and under designed for and actually where the most interesting and exciting design and innovation can happen. There's four images on the slide here and each one of them comes from a piece of research that we've run at open. The one on the, the first one is of a gentleman in England, of course, because he's wearing a tie and a shirt buttoned up to the top and a tie and a long black leather jacket. And his low vision, so he's got a monocle, um, so like like um, uh, to to enhance the uh, his vision so that he can read the signage in the supermarket that he's in. This was a piece of wayfinding work, and in fact, I had the pleasure of going to the Coopy Hewitt earlier this year and seeing the sign uh, exhibition that they had there. And signage is one of those areas of design that. Many people don't think about it's just there in the environment around us all the time that thought and consideration goes into how signage is created 
who it's useful for and how useful it might be. And of course, some people can get excluded and particularly people with sight loss of different levels, but also people who think differently or who can't see things because they're at a different height. So this was a really interesting piece of research for you know, this supermarket organization to help them understand how wayfinding within the store helps people manage what, they, what they're there to do, which is of course, get the basket of goods they want um, and go home. The next one, and that's, that's really around um, understanding. So just understanding where is the friction? Where are the barriers today? The next one is of a woman who's a, a, a black American woman who's got pretty disabled, powerful on her shirt. And Leisha, she's one of our co uh, community leads um, in the US. And she's laughing because we we're talking about wearables design and she was sharing some of her experience about wearables. And this was about ideation. So really understanding and ideating together. Where is it that these things work? Where don't they? And how might they work better for different people with different needs? Um, Alicia's a wheelchair user. And so her needs um, and, and has some limited dexterity challenges. So her needs you know, are specific and unmet by quite a lot of the wearables that are there today. Also as an intersectional individual, skin tone and her skin tone with you know, additional pigmentation, she was talking about had more challenges with some of the wearables she uses than with others. So again, design, just not taking into consideration some of the differences that can make things work or not work for different individuals. The next one was about co-creation. So we've got a gentleman who's a wheelchair user, an electric wheelchair user, um, and he's talking to a Google Doc, which is a little bit difficult to see there. So it's good that I'm audio describing it and using voice UI that had been designed and testing out the latest design of an iterative co-creation process. So this is really feeding back in with the design team as it's being created to give rapid cycles of input as to what does and doesn't work well. And the last one is um, a gentleman who is looking at an app and it's uh, a, a banking app. And this is when just before you know, it, had, it had been created and was testing that this worked and testing out in this case that um, the ID sta uh, stage of it worked for someone um, with, you know, for him, uh, non-visible disabilities, but neurodivergent individual going through quite a complex, um, you know, processes can be very complex, particularly banking processes and checking that that worked um, at a stage when there was still a design layer to go before completion. Next slide, please. In short, this says you can engage people all the way through. Oh, I'm so sorry. This one, uh, for some reason, the, the uh, print has got very small on us. Research has a disability inclusion problem. Therefore, design has an exclusion problem. This is the fundamentals that we work in every day is to try and address this disability inclusion problem in research. If we are over listening to some parts of society and are under listening to others, particularly those with more specific needs and more distinct requirements, we're going to under design and we're going to cause exclusion. So there's such an opportunity here. And the opportunity is disability really is an addressable design problem. This is talking about very much, obviously, the social model of disability of it's that point at which design fails people. There's also an identity of disability, which many people own and love, and there's a culture and community that goes with this. But here we're really challenging the design failures that create disabling environments, and it is highly addressable. It's really significant. Many people move, sense, think, feel, or communicate in significantly enough, in significantly different ways so that the environments as they're designed today don't work for them. Um, I think it was Lenny Henry, who's a BBC journalist, who did some work um, in his, that he put into a book called Access All Areas, which was, this is British based. I think it was 6% of the UK had what would be considered majority characteristics once you layer them all on top of each other. It's a very significant minority that is very significantly over designed for. So whether it's gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic, disability, 
all the different characteristics that get marginalised, they actually are the significant majority community brought together. Um, the difference between exclusion through design and inclusion and delight through design and here is really the insight who we're asking how we're asking them and how we can engage so to get really creative curious open and diverse you know designers to open the space for that and that's also bringing more people into the design community with more perspectives and making more space right throughout the creative process from where what might we find it a problem that needs to be addressed so where what might we even put that creative energy right through to checking that something that's been put out in society is working as it was expected next slide please so humans differ way more than we currently design for and this is just such a lovely opportunity for us all the legacy design practices that we have really um can, it can limit us. And here we've got an illustration of four people on one side of a wall who all um, appear to be white, three of them are men, they're all wearing suits, one, one um, is, is female appearing. And on the wall is written norms, inaccessibility, bias, discrimination and skills gaps, which in my perspective are the reasons that people don't get to see the majority of the community, which can be on the other side of the wall. On the other side of the wall in the in the shade are people in a broader range of clothing you know someone with a service dog someone who's a wheelchair user a woman who's short of stature just a broader range of humanity so really to get beyond empathy we need to make space and actually empathy is talked about a lot particularly at the moment empathy is a really important starting point but it's an insufficient starting point because I can't possibly imagine what it's like to be someone else, particularly with my neurodivergent brain. Being me is complex enough to imagine being someone else, you know, is something I can't do. But I can ask and be curious in a constrained and useful way relevant to the space that I'm designing for, for others to describe what's relevant to that space. So empathy is a great starting point just in recognising that there are others that are very different to ourselves, but then stepping beyond that in terms of understanding that difference is really about making space, not trying to understand in someone else's shoes or wheels. Beyond research subjects to get to co-researchers, co-designers, roles, really layered participation throughout and layered power throughout. Um, beyond the minimum viable product, which often overemphasizes characteristics that are majority of characteristics, start it with a minimum equitable, valuable product. Um, so really thinking about equity and value, not just minimum viable, which can often do quite significant harm in the process. And you, you, organize, you know, people that create things always think they'll go back and fix them. But once harm is created, it tends to last a lot longer than it was expected. Getting beyond funky features that seemed really cool at the time to designing value, designing solutions. There is so much power in society at the moment. We have technology and creativity coming at us in such wonderful ways to solve for, we've also got significant unmet and undermet needs in our society. So to bring these two together in really useful and practical ways in creating solutions rather than things that that are meaningless features, which can be described as disability dongles. Um, so getting beyond those things that were designed for, but not with and by people with disabilities who know what's useful and know what might just be something that's a bit of an add on that is a lot of energy put into not much value inclusion led. <laughs> I'm going to jump in here for a moment, if that's OK, uh, uh, just I want to shift us so that we can talk, we can have a couple okay. of questions before we go to the audience Q and A, um, and you were like just getting to a point that is really useful I think for us to all. That was it. About. So thank you. So thank you, thank you, and I apologize um, being taking moderator uh, privilege here um, to jump in here uh, just because anyway there's a lot a lot so many things in my mind, um, and we'll we'll lose the slides so that we can see all of us and I think that we'll spotlight all of us is that correct. 
So we'll get all of our people up here on the screen um, and uh, our interpreter as well. So, um, so I, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions sort of generally, and then I, I know the audience already has questions, so we will get to those as well. Um, the right where you were ending there, Christine, you were really emphasizing the idea of like designing with and you know taking into consideration so many of the kind of complex and specific perspectives that um, disabled people have. And I wonder if I could just ask you all, the title of this panel is Centering Disability. And I wonder if you could just say what that means to you in your practice. You know, I guess we're thinking in particular, what does it not mean? But um, what are some of the guiding principles that you um, sort of think about when you think about centering or prioritizing disability? And yeah, I should say in your design lives. So go ahead and jump in, panelists. Don't be afraid, and we'll get to all of you. Um, I'll start. This is Olivia. Um, well, for me, uh, the process always kind of starts out as a selfish exercise, you know? Um, how can I design spaces so that I can use it? Um, and joking aside, really what that translates to is trying to find out what I can do to emphasize and understand how to create spaces that not that's not just something disabled people can access, but disabled people can thrive in. And you know, the answer to that is to talk to disabled people, um, bringing them into the conversation. Um, design becomes more inclusive and richer when we have people of different types in the room from the very beginning of the design process. And I think, you know, that's where the importance of visibility and representation come in. Um, just talking to past and present colleagues, um, a lot of them have said that they never understood why certain building codes exist until they see me interact with it. Um, and even as a disabled person, you know, all I know is my own lived experiences. Um, I don't know what it's like to be blind or deaf or neurodivergent. Um, you know, one of my best friends who's also in a wheelchair, uh, we still run into circumstances where I go, oh, I didn't think of that. Um, and, you know, yeah, so it, it, it kind of highlights that importance of um, getting to know disabled people, talking to them, because um, there's a lot of insights that a lot of you know architects and people in the in the building industry um, have, have to learn more about. Um, thanks, thanks so much for that, Olivia. Sky, do you want to jump in here? Yeah, this is Sky speaking. Uh, yeah, I also I'm always talking to everybody about their needs. Um, every single model who's ever modeled for me, I've interviewed. Uh, I always ask them what what would make clothing more accessible to their bodies, uh, their body minds, what would show off their gender expression best, parts of their body they want to highlight, parts they feel, feel vulnerable about, and then parts they feel vulnerable about but want to highlight in this context, and then like favorite colors and patterns. And I take all of that and try to make like a dream garment for them that might be pushing a little bit uh, more brightly colored <laughs> and more radically visible than they're used to, but it always has a really fun result and I can really see in their body uh, and like mood and attitude and confidence how much it just completely transforms them when they're wearing rebirth garments or wearing something that they see as radically visible and just how much being able to take that space for ourselves and refusing to assimilate to these cis heteronormative patriarchal beauty ideals is just like the best way for us to to live um, and and find community um, I understand that it's not always safe for us to be visible um, but just like picking and choosing what the circumstances and situations are where they feel safe 
to do so and then really pushing those boundaries so that then uh yeah then you can make friends because somebody will be like oh I am really interested in what you're wearing like what's this all about or like uh I really see it as a type of flagging um so in queer culture there's like hanky code and and flagging so that queer folks in the know know that you're queer so I see the way that I dress as a type of flagging to attract um not like not like relationship like romantic attract but like just like attract friends to become um yeah part of my community so yeah and I think I've been when I started I would say that the clothing line was for the full spectrum of gender size and ability but that was doing a lot to try to make Abel's a little bit more comfortable with what I was doing because they were so disturbed. <laughs> but now that I'm a little bit more established, I feel much more uh, good about just being like, I make clothing for queer and trans disabled folks of all sizes. And like, yes, I am all about intersectionality, but like, it doesn't necessarily have to include you if you're a white cis thin able-bodied able-minded person like not all spaces are for you um so yeah um thanks guy I love how both you and Olivia are talking also about kind of like inter disabled or like disabled community you know sharing um I often think from my own work of like how much of historical access guides and accessible spaces often assume that there was like only one disabled person in a space, right? And only one type of disability. There's a, um, you know, you saw in design school, you sometimes see these like personas where it's like one person has a broken arm, one person uses a wheelchair and, it, you know, one person is deaf and doesn't, um, you know, incorporate the idea that like someone might be deaf and be a wheelchair user, right? Um, but these, and these kinds of connections. Um, uh, Christine, I'd love to hear your perspective on this too. I think that's a really important point is that the practices around accessibility. I, the, the analogy I often use is it's like going to Cirque du Soleil and getting excited by the safety net. You know, it's really important there's a safety net there. I'm so glad that people love building the safety net and making sure that it works and it's safe, but it's not what you go there for. And I love hearing Sky when um, you're talking about the joy, the delight, the fun, the experience of wearing the clothes that you make specifically for individuals. Olivia, when you're talking about the space in the university that has been created, that is beautiful. You know, accessibility is such a minimalist way at, of looking at the world. And it's actually how a lot of it's taught today. It's, like, it's important. And let's recognize that having minimum standards is a really valuable part of design. But what's really important is for designers to enhance their creativity by listening, by learning, by finding friction, by finding constraints and enjoying and really um, thriving in those as opposed to shying away from them. There is such um, opportunity to do better, not just in terms of accessibility, but in terms of the usability, dignity, adaptability, because as you say, it, not all spaces are for all people. We want adaptability and optionality not everyone is going to want everything, um, enabling the individuality to come through um, and essentially designing overall for experience. And the only way to do that is by listening. The one thing I'd say is you can't, people might listen to this and go, but how do I do that? There's so much diversity within disability. Actually, it's one person who's so different from your perspective, and then go to one more that's so different from the two and just keep building in layers within the relevant layers of that design space that you're considering. Um, great, thank you. I mean, one thing that, I, I, you know, uh, I was struck reading your bio, Christine, like you have so many different backgrounds and I'm sure that's true also for other panelists. Um, but I wanted to ask you a little bit, I mean, this is my kind of nerdy question as someone who works at an art and design school. 
um, where these issues, I'll say, are more present than when I started teaching 15 years ago, but still um, are often not really covered. Um, and I wonder if you could say a little bit about like what you did learn in school, but for those things that you didn't learn in school, where else you've looked to um, to learn in this area? Um, and I'll just, I'll leave it open-ended like that. There's lots to kind of get, ask within that, but I, I'd love you to speak a little bit about like, how do you get into this? Um, field. Obviously, you're working from lived experience, but what are some of the other things that really shaped, you know, some of the other ways that you think, um, you know, that, that you found to learn about accessibility and to learn about this approach? School didn't help. Sorry for those in school, but uh, just as a start, um, I did things that weren't that useful. The thing that they learned, the thing that I learned from school that was really helpful was I learned how to learn, I learned how to work hard. That was helpful. The actual learning, a lot of that I've had to really actively go and unlearn because it wasn't that useful. And in fact, not even was it not that useful. Some of it was just fundamentally wrong. So I think um, one of the interesting things is a key part of continuous learning is continually letting go of useless beliefs that are just not helping you and continually looking for them to let them go. So um, I, I love, I'm very curious. I love being curious. I love constantly learning. I read a huge amount, but mainly I talk to people and I, if you put it within the relevance of what you're looking at at the time, the things that you can actually influence that is that's the way I've learned and obviously creating space for people to share that all the time has been you know, what I do for a living so that's obviously something I take great pleasure and joy in but we can all do that in our own ways and actually when we talk about design to me that's everyone that's not someone with a capital D design on their card we all design whether it's the sort of social space that we have with our friends whether that's what we do and we're ourselves, whether that's um, how we engage with our teams at work or, or physical spaces, physical products or anything. So just constantly considering what's a better outcome here? Who might be missing in the consideration of that today? And how might we engage with them to learn you know, what that experience is so that you can infuse the creativity just with better thought? Um, thanks for that. I think that's a great question that comes up often of like, who are we missing? Because there, you know, there may be some discussion included, right? But um, more work to do there. Um, Olivia, thoughts on the school question or other other places of learning? Yeah. Um, I mean, for, for architecture school, it, that's kind of a, a, a beast on, <laughs> on its own, right? And um, when I was an undergrad, um, learning about accessibility, it was close to none. Uh, and it's very unfortunate. And like you, like you said, Bess, I had to rely on my own lived experiences um, to understand how to design for disabled people. Um, so when I was applying to grad school, I had to be really intentional when seeking out programs that would teach me about universal design, um, you know, when it was time to decide which one to go to, I literally called all of them and asked, hey, this is what I want to learn about. What can you provide for me? And most of them have responded with kind of this generic, mm, I mean, we kind of know people that could help you. Um, and I ended up going to University of Oregon where the response was, oh, this professor, um, you know, specializes in universal design, and this professor uh, teaches a class, a required class um, that has a whole section on um, designing for, you know, disabilities. So, um, yeah, so I had to be really intentional with that. Um, but I mean, right now, I, I've been super grateful to be part of conversations just like this one. Um, you know, being part of the AIA, the American Institute of Architects, I you know, have been given a lot of opportunities to facilitate and participate in these conversations. And we invite students um, to, you know, like 
participate in these conversations and that that becomes a, a really crucial of part of their learning experience um and then something that I'm really advocating for right now. Uh, so I actually have more disabled students in architecture school. I think that's something that's going to be like an, a, a, a rich addition um, to that learning experience. Um, and it's a huge task because doing that also means redefining what architecture school is like. Um, so it's going to be this long but very worthy process. Um, so yeah. Sky. This is Sky speaking. Um, so I went to the School of the Art Institute, which is where Bess works. Um, and I truly think that it was one of the worst decisions of my life to go to college at all, uh, but especially the School of the Art Institute. They straight up deceived me about what they were all about. I think a lot of times, whatever schools say that they are like centering and what they value and what they're all about is where they need to work on the most. Um, I do remember that when I did like the tour in the fashion department, because that was where I originally intended on going to, they did have such an emphasis on how like how unhealthy of a lifestyle it was they would be bragging about how the students would bring their sleeping bags and sleep in the hallways because like yeah they weren't being given enough time in class they weren't be being given enough tools or resources so the fact that they were like they thought it was so funny and such a a brag about things but I just saw it as something that SAC should be so embarrassed about and so ashamed to be uh talking about because I'm positive that my stomach disability wouldn't have gotten as bad as it did if I didn't go to college uh and to, to SAC specifically because even though I was a hard worker, I've always been really good at and like thrive, like, well, yeah, looked like I'm thriving in school. I've, I've always been very successful in school, but uh, it, the toll it took on my body and my brain was not worth it. I had panic attacks my whole life, every single day, pretty much for all of the times that I was in school. And as soon as I graduated, I stopped having panic attacks and I hardly have them now. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah, maybe that environment is just not great for neurodivergent folks, for disabled folks. It was also awful to be a person of color at SAC and a queer person. Um, so I did a lot of my learning around disability design. It, it was all self-directed. Um, so I did have a couple of amazing teachers uh, and I say a couple because it was only a couple, uh, like R Romy Crawford, who I wrote my manifesto, Radical Visibility, a Queer Crip Dress Reform Movement for, but I just did a lot of reading about Crip theory outside of class to include as um, references in that. Um, but yeah, like when I started Rebirth Garments, before I wrote the manifesto, I would tell my classmates or my teachers about the work that I was doing. And I was like, I'm, I want to make clothing for queers with disabilities. And then every single time people will be like, queerness isn't a disability. How insulting you're being. And like, you know, we worked so hard to get out of the DSM. And I'm like, I don't think any of y'all know what you're talking about to begin with. But yeah, they just didn't realize that queer, that disabled folks could have a sexuality or even a gender <laughs> if they wanted to. Uh, so they thought that I was saying uh, queerness was a disability when I was like, no, queers with disabilities. <laughs> um, and I just wanna to note, you know, I think one of the key things that Sky brings up here is the kind of work ethic or sort of, yeah, sort of boasting about hard work that I have encountered at many, many design schools. When, so when design schools, I'll just, just get, 
on my own soapbox, but when I speak at design schools and they ask us like, well, what should we do? You know, who should we work for in terms of access? And I'm like, look within, you know, is your own school a place that you can attend without staying up all night? Um, you know, always, always working in the studio um, in, in a specific place or using a particular kind of desk, or, you know, using particular kinds of visual media. Um, these are all core questions for all of our institutions to ask museums, um, schools, uh, all kinds of workplaces. So I just really um, appreciate you all um, thinking to that, uh, recognizing that those school situations are often not feeding us. Um, but then just to say that all of you are doing work to like educate as well um, at the same time. Um, I, I want us to um, move to Q&A because there's a lot of great questions. But before I do, I'll just ask you all, um, you know, you're all doing amazing work, you know, in your own sort of professional um, spheres. But I wonder, where do you look to for inspiration? What do you see outside of your own practice that's innovative or that's exciting to you? Um, whether it's resources that we can suggest for the audience or just work that you're seeing, themes that you're seeing, um, just to, to close out this part of our discussion. I'm happy to start here. Thanks. I just, um, in terms of, and it kind of goes to the question before, is there are teachers everywhere there are things to learn everywhere, including in academic institutions. There's some wonderful work going on there, actually, especially by the students. So you, you see papers coming out across different universities, but also by academics. There's some, you know, there's wonderful work. There's wonderful work happening in organisations. There's wonderful work happening with innovators and entrepreneurs. And there's wonderful individuals sharing experiences and sharing ideas. So um, follow your curiosity would be my one thing and actually just rather than you know, spend the time when you've got spare time learning in fields that you're not so comfortable or confident in but you're curious about so and there's so many places um, within the disabilities um, uh, sphere there are some you know wonderful disability groups there are great um, uh, places to learn where people share you know share experiences there's great community um for for people to learn from all the time it's just going there rather than expecting it's going to come to you so i think learning is almost unlimited and following your own passions and your own curiosity towards it it's amazing how many doors open up and get a little bit um just ask people it's amazing who you could meet if you just reach out and ask people as an example anyone here you know, reach out and ask us as panelists and say i'm interested in um, something specific so ask people that you really admire and respect and you can learn from them i just find teachers everywhere sorry i just realized that was very non-specific no. which is <laughs> it's fine it's fine sky olivia any thoughts uh, this is Sky speaking. I, I'm most inspired by uh, disability justice, queer theory, crip theory, fat liberation. Um, but I really, I've been so inspired by the kids, kids and teens that I work with uh, as a person who's always um, seen as a teen. Um, most, I'm about to be 32, like in two weeks, but everybody thinks that I'm 16 uh, and just like seeing how terribly people treat kids and teens and don't take them seriously. Uh, and yeah, as a young looking person uh, being like, I don't want, I don't want just me to be taken seriously or other young looking adults. I want kids and teens to be taken seriously. So I love just getting to know what the kids and teens these days, what they need and want, and then just trying to come up with fun liberatory solutions uh, that are joyful for them. Yeah, I wanna echo what um, both Christina and Sky have said. Um, and also, I, I mean, being involved and active in the design research world, like having, 
being able to travel um, and seeing um, how other countries have um, and other, I mean, other cities, even from from the one that I live in, um, how they have dealt with accessibility in the built environment. Um, those are those are the ways that I really find inspiration and um, and again motivation to to do more good work. Um, all right, thank you all so much. We're not done yet, but we're going to take a short break to just breathe for a second. Folks in the audience, please add your questions and comments um, to the chat. Um, and I'll pull out some key gems uh, to talk about um, when we come back um, in just a few minutes here. This is Kirsten. Um, thank you, Best. Sorry, interpreter's back on screen. Um, just we'll we'll take a break for five minutes. So we'll come back at four fourteen Eastern, um, and we'll have. A little bit of time for questions. We have some great questions in the Q and A. Uh, we won't be able to get to them all, but please feel free to keep dropping them in, and we'll get to as many as we can. So, see you all in five minutes. Thank you. All of them. Um, but I'm gonna chew, pull some out and see if we can get um, some thoughts. So. Um, one question, which I think was sort of mostly pitched um, to Sky and Olivia, um, and I'll just say it was written by our friend and colleague, Jen White Johnson, who herself is a wonderful designer, graphic designer, activist, parent, and um, graphic design professor as well, um, who's done a lot of work in this space. But Jen asked, and I'm going to read from her question, what advice do you have for young disabled designers and students on how to show up unapologetically in spaces where the disabled aesthetic or disabled contribution is sometimes erased or even co-opted? This is Sky speaking. Um, yeah, I know sometimes it's really hard. Uh, for me, I had a lot of social anxiety uh, but this was like my main way to uh, relate to people. Uh, you know, I mean, since I'm neurodivergent, I'd like need <laughs> something to like make people come to me so that I can make friends. Um, but yeah, I guess I just don't really, I've never really listened to like authority figures that much about like, uh, yeah, what I should be doing. It's it's a really hard path to choose <laughs> to like constantly have to argue with teachers who should know better, but they just want to keep with the status quo. But I guess for me, I just decided not to go into the fashion department and instead I took fiber arts classes because they were more in line with my values. Um, and like, let me do more of the things that I was interested in. Um, but yeah, any, also in Radical Visibility Manifesto, I always talk about like, like the having current approaches to radical visibility, but saying that sometimes we'll have to change it up because they, it might get co-opted or it has been co-opted. So like, yeah, right now I'm still doing all very colorful stuff, but like, Another way could be wearing just like all white or like all reflective fabrics or um, wearing only things that are like really, really big. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, just always trying to be flexible and adaptive to change uh, with the environment that goes with, um, that just stays true to your values. Um, and that, yeah, adults and teachers don't know everything. Like, it's really easy for you as a young person to be like, oh, I guess I have to listen to them. But you truly never have to listen. I mean, I know for safety, sometimes you might have to, like, mask or, like, just go with what the teachers are saying. But, like, you don't have to believe what they are telling you. <laughs> 
in your core. That's great. Olivia? Yeah. I mean, it's like what Sky said, it's, it's kind of a hard path to go on to be this unapologetically invisible. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's important to to note and to encourage younger people, um, especially younger disabled designers and students, um, to be confident that you you know your stuff. You know, it, you already you have the lived experiences, and I think very often um, that is much more valuable than what you learn in a textbook. Um, and yeah, just 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 be confident about that. I I think that's often it's something that I had to learn um, for a for a long time. Um, like it took me a while to kind of to kind of gain that confidence and be like, um, yes, I I know my stuff. I know how to design for people like me, and I know how. Um, to talk to other people and find out how, you know, what their needs are. Also, it, this isn't, um, I guess, don't let what other potentially more experienced people tell you that you're wrong when you know that you've already lived it and you know that what you're thinking about is right. So, um, yeah. I mean, this is kind of echoing what Sky had said already. Um, but I love that. Just to say, I love that. You know, like you know what you're talking about. I mean, I think trust, tr having young folks to trust their instincts, and also to to acknowledge how, for those um, young people who grow up with a disability, who grow up navigating educational and social systems, they often have a lot of expertise that their faculty don't know about. Um, and that's something I think significant. And I'll just say, you know, as a perspective from a perspective of someone came up. Um, in school and grad school who is not disabled, right? That that there's a lot of writing about design and disability that's not written from the perspective of disabled people and seeking out those perspectives. Um, and that includes recognizing that, um, you know, if you are a disabled student in a design school, you are st strong, you're making a huge contribution, right? Your perspectives are valuable. Um, and I don't want to say valuable, sounds so monetizing, right? But valid um, is, is such a significant, um, uh, you know, I, I guess was a significant realization for me in my own education. Um, I'm going to try to kind of combine that. There are a few questions about kind of finding the right people to work with, right? Which is to say, you know, how do, how, what are some of your experiences in finding the right people to work with? But that might also be, you know, are there barriers for, especially I'm thinking maybe Christine for you, working with bigger corporate um, entities of kind of uh, making sure that they're getting the right perspectives without basically asking disabled people to work for free um, or to be sort of, you know, tacked on at the end. Um, can can folks um, take on some of the, some of those questions, whatever that might mean to you in your very different um, design processes? Thanks, Bess. I'm more than happy to kind of pick up on this for a start. I think the first thing is it needs to be fair. So, you know, the, the working for free, no, absolutely not. You know, all our research, as an example, is always paid research and it's paid you know, well above standard research rates for a really good reason, because you're taking more out of someone's day if there's more complexity in their day anyway. So um, making sure it's equitable to start, to make sure that it's inclusive, that the space that you're inviting people into requires really designing and co-researching with people with different lived experiences. So we have community leaders that actually help us design our research. They have lived experience of, you know, seven different sub communities within you know, our, our broader community. And they themselves are leaders within their community. So spend time understanding beyond their lived experience, other experiences within their community. So say the sight loss community, hearing loss community, dexterity, mobility, neurodivergence, chronic health and so on. So to design that space with people that have got that experience, because no one of us has all those experiences and we can't possibly, um, to invite people in and give them the microphone to not just always control the questions, but to actually give people the opportunity to shape 
how they express so there's an element of that that, that you can't you need to control because you're asking things in a, a specifically designed way to get uh, feedback that you can then analyze and understand uh, in a really useful way that there's an element of freedom that needs to be provided in all research as well to give people the opportunity to express things that you just didn't even know were there you didn't even know the right question to ask so it's an art as much as it is a science um, but working with the different communities and actually for us you know having that in our organization to have that different sets of muscles almost think of it that way that can help us know where to spend that energy and then of course doing it within guidelines of clear easy to understand and completely aligned to consent fair and equitable payments and also sharing back with people your influence this this is where it's going to go this is what's going to happen with it next so also just clarity of where does this sit in the process and giving people agency to understand their role in the broader creative process these are some of the things we do and we're just to be clear we don't have this we're always learning we're always trying to improve what we're doing and every time we get a new research project in a new space we kind of have to learn again because it's a new space where we might get things wrong so that's what we do to start with but that's not right and there'll be more things that we're going to keep learning as well mm -hmm. Um, Olivia or Sky, any thoughts on this idea of kind of working with the right folks or getting, uh, I, I'm also thinking of like kind of barriers to to collaborate sometimes true too, right? Um, uh, sometimes setting up a collaboration itself to be accessible can be a challenge. Any thoughts? Um, this is Olivia and uh, I've had experiences over the last few years of trying to um, like find people and collaborate with people on, on these, on talking about these types of topics. And, um, and I think some of the questions that we have on here ask, like, how do we find these people? You know, where do we find these people? And um, really you have to be very intentional and write a lot of cold emails and make a lot of cold phone calls. Um, and that's where I kind of find value in um really just talking to basically everyone <laughs> um and and asking who do who do you know that could fit in this um who who would be interested and and can fit in this profile that could that could help uh with with this conversation and um yeah a, another big thing is um compensation and making sure that uh the the value that they bring to the table is um, is met with a well, compensation. Um, Thank you. Yes, this is really key. And just to say, we cannot just assume that disabled people have endless amounts of time to educate others, right? To do your research. I the, the suggestion I always give my students too, or my my own self is also to do your research before you talk to someone. So you're not asking them the same questions that are already out there. Um, to, uh, to ask sort of basic accessibility um, kinds of questions when, you know, we can think of like, we're asking people for sort of their advanced level of, of input um, as well. But yeah, that compensation, this is just access should be built into the budget and compensating collaborators should be built into um, into any budget. Um, uh, I, I was curious, there's there's one question here and, and this is a question I always think of, you know, we all know where access doesn't work, but I wonder if we could end this by sharing, you know, some of our favorite examples of accessibility and maybe that's a small um, uh, aspect, maybe that's a, a tool or a feature that we like to include. Um, what are some of the things that we think of as like on our list of best, best, um, kinds of examples? This is Sky speaking. Um, one of my favorite, uh, projects that I've personally worked on, uh, is the Radical Visibility Collective. And these are performances. They're very much like my typical fashion performances for rebirth garments, but I bring in other folks um, for two of the collections. It was designed 
co-designed by me, Jake Bogues, and Compton Q. Um, but Jake Bogues uh, is like a queer pop star here. They, they mostly just go by Bogues. And they wanted to make um, music based off of my manifesto. But I did a show where I, I didn't really have time to do audio descriptions of all the outfits due to the um, institution's lack of time for that. And so I asked folks if they would make songs based off of my manifesto, but where the lyrics um, were, were the audio descriptions at the same time. And I really loved the results and it's something that I feel very happy with. So uh, y'all can check out those videos at um, vimeo.com slash rebirth garments. And they're just the ones that are labeled Radical Visibility Collective and RVC too. So yeah, that's my favorite joyful access. Uh, thanks, Sky. Olivia? Yeah, I'm thinking about this. And um, so in the realm of environmental <laughs> design, one of kind of the latest things that um, pop into my head is uh, things that kind of started becoming more of a thing when the pandemic happened, and that is uh, hands-free automation of everything. Um, and it's something that I hope to continue and we don't lose over time now that we're quote unquote getting back um, to whatever normal <laughs> used to be. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, it, I think when the pandemic started and all of a sudden, all of these new hands-free technology started popping up, um, it gave, you know, the physically disabled community kind of this, um, it was, it's something that we have been asking for for a long time and it was never worth the money or the time um, until it became, you know, a worldwide need all of a sudden. And then we, we put in the, those investments and um, it, it, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's such a small thing and something that we take kind of for granted now, but there's still places where, you know, we can't even open the door um, because there isn't like an automatic push button that we can um, that we can use. So this trend that started because of the pandemic um, is something that I hope to see kind of continue on. Um, and I'm really excited for what I hope to be the future of this kind of um, automation. Um, thanks so much. We just have, we're a little one minute over. Christine, if I could ask you just real quick to add yours. I'll very quickly say um, things that work end to end. So things where people have thought about how people find it, the packaging, how they might open it, how they get it from out of the packet to working, how they can recharge it or manage it, how they can get service. So. And, and that's just as true of a service. So banking services, we work in quite a lot of things that would be seen as boring industries, making them, you don't even notice that it's designed in, you don't even notice that that quiet space was designed with you, you don't even notice that banking service was designed in such a way that neurodivergent individuals can get a loan more easily because the work was done for you. So to me, great design can sometimes be very, very quiet. That's such a great um, big picture spot for us to end with. Thank you so much. Really just a delight to have the three of you, especially because your practices are all so different, but so many of the themes that you touched on um, bring us together. Thank you so much for such a great participatory audience. The emoji webinar feature is really like giving me life right now. So it's wonderful. Thank you all for your, not, your, your notice um, and your questions in the chat. Um, Kirsten, I'll hand it to you in case there's any business that happens to happen at the end here. Otherwise, thank you so much. 
Yeah, this is Kirsten. Um, I want to give a huge thank you to Bess and to our panelists for such a really wonderful conversation. I wish we could sit here all day and talk, but we do have to, I guess, go on with our lives. Um, I, I want to visually describe that there are hearts and, and clapping emojis and little party poppers popping up all over the screen, um, which is really lovely. That's what Bess was, was referencing before. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us. Um, the recording of this panel will be posted to Cooper Hewitt's YouTube channel in just a couple of weeks. Um, and I will also drop my email in the chat and I'll say it out loud as well. Um, it's Sweeney, S-W-E-E-N-E-Y-K at S-I dot E-D-U. If you have any follow-up questions about this panel, about other events at Cooper Hewitt, um, I'm happy to chat. Um, so thank you all again for joining us. Um, come, if you're in New York, come to Cooper Hewitt for some more of our National Design Week celebrations um, through the end of Sunday this week. And uh, have a great rest of your Thursday, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone.